and welcome to Teal Talks, where we have bold, intelligent conversations with innovators, activists, and thought leaders from around the world. I'm Jennifer Zachary, General Counsel for Merck, known as MSD outside the US and Canada. From the rise of extreme weather events to the expansion of infectious disease ranges, it's evident that climate change is a critical health challenge. So today, we're breaking down the impacts of climate change on human health and the role businesses can play in creating change. Here to discuss all of that and more, Sophia Chiani, a climate activist and founder of the nonprofit Climate Cardinals, Dr. Cheryl Holder, an internist and co-chair of the nonprofit Florida Clinicians for Climate Action, and Joel McCower, a sustainable business expert and co-founder of the Green Biz Group. Thank you all so much for joining me today. I think we'll start out with you, Dr. Holder. Yeah. So the impacts of climate change, I think a lot of us think about them as something that we're worried could happen in the future. But are there some effects of climate change that we're seeing right now that, that we might be missing? Yeah, thanks for having me. We are definitely feeling the effects of climate change right now. And if you think about the impact, there are really four big ways. Directly, when you think the heat or when we have extreme weather events or the pollution that's causing it. Then we think of the spread of diseases. Then we think of disruption of our water and food supply. And last but not least, our emotional well being. So if you put in those larger categories, take folks who have asthma, the pollution could worsen the asthma, the heat, ozone layer, all the different impacts that we see. When we think the wildfires, increased rates of heart attacks. When we think of this, the spread of disease, we know about Zika and chikungunya. When you think of the tick-borne diseases up in the Northeast and around the world, we are going to see more spread of disease. So overall, every aspect of our body, right now, most of us are feeling something, especially emotionally, when we have to deal with these extreme weather events, the concern about what's going on with climate. So all of us are impacted now. Thank you, Dr. Holder. That's really quite sobering. Maybe then transition a little bit to Sophia, thinking about the future. So Sophia, your nonprofit helps to educate people about climate change by translating climate information in over a hundred languages. How do you think that the global population's views on climate change have evolved over the last few years? Well, I definitely think that in the last few years, we've made a lot of progress in increasing climate literacy. With that being said, I do think that there is still a lot of work to be done in terms of improving climate change education. I remember that there was a survey done that showed that um, only one state in the United States received an A on their climate change curriculum, while several received failing grades. And so while there has been an increase in climate literacy overall, I do think that climate change education does need to be strengthened. And specifically, I think that climate justice education needs to be strengthened. So not just looking at the climate crisis as a black and white issue, but also educating people about the ramifications of environmental racism and the fact that people of color are disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis and we need to make sure that we're taking low-income and minority communities into consideration when we're designing solutions. Yeah, it certainly seems like we have a lot of opportunity there. And maybe picking up the thread you just talked about, sort of disparate impacts of climate change, maybe I could throw that back to you, Dr. Holler, and sort of ask you a question around, you know, we know that climate change is affecting health, but in particular, how is it affecting the health of the most vulnerable among us? When you look at what caused our climate, the massive industrialization, the pollution, when you think where a lot of those, those factories and those communities that were most impacted, they're often poorer communities. When you think of where highways were done, which spewing all the pollution from transportation, it often cuts through the heart of many poorer communities. It's not just in the US, but I'm from Jamaica. The fishermen, because of the, the pollution in the population, are suffering, the beach erosion, so our tourism is being impacted. You go in the migration because of the desert, the desertification of much of the world and the droughts across the world and the migration from South America, Africa. We are seeing the impacts. And of course, poor people have less resources to be able to combat it and are feeling it now. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't hear that and not think, okay, what can I do? 
And so at our company, we have announced what I think are ambitious goals to achieve carbon neutrality across our operations by 2025. And we've set science-based targets to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And so Joel, I'll go to you with this question. It's, um, you know, what role do companies play in addressing the impacts of climate change? Yeah, it's a great question, Jennifer. I mean, what we've seen over the past few years is what I call a flipping of the script. So for a long time, the conversation was mostly focused on what are the impacts of business on the climate? And that's still a, obviously a huge issue and we'll, we can talk a lot about that. But what's also interesting is that we're now starting to think about, well, what's the impact of the climate on business? How do companies function in a world uh, where the, the, not only is the climate changing and, and the, a huge amount of disruption, but also affecting the people, both inside the company and in communities, uh, the customers uh, and around them, um, this becomes a, a very big issue. It all boils down to one word, risk. There's a lot of different types of risk in companies, uh, regulatory risk, transitional risk, technology risk, uh, reputational risk, right to operate, supply chain, continuity risk. Uh, we've been seeing a number of those things play out in the, in, in the world in the, the past year or so, it, particularly in 2022, uh, supply chain and other kinds of things, lots of, of risks. And so risk isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, companies take risks all the time. It's a calculus. Of if, they didn't, if they didn't take risks, they probably wouldn't do anything new. They wouldn't be innovating new drugs and, and healthcare solutions. But, but, but that's the issue. And then, of course, coming back to Dr. Holder and, and, and to Sophia's points, uh, this is also the risk on people. And climate change is increasingly, to Dr. Holder's point, creating an unhealthy world. That has huge impacts on business and commerce, supply chains, employee wellness, and ability to, to come and, and hold a job, we saw, as we saw during the pandemic. So this is, has huge, huge business implications that we're just in some ways starting to see. So one of the questions I have is what kind of challenges are companies going to face as they aim to, to reach the reductions that are called for by the Paris Climate Agreement? You know, that's to say the net zero emissions by the middle of next century at the latest. Maybe Joel, you could take that? The real challenge in all this is, in a word, change. Uh, we're talking about transforming business, markets, economies, supply chains, uh, even uh, the business models of a lot of companies. Um, and, you know, change is hard. When we talk about change, I think people love the noun, but hate the verb. You know, we love the idea of change, but actually changing is difficult. And we're talking about massive changes, really reinventing and rebuilding our economy, our global economy, over the coming decades. We, it's not something that, that's a nice to do. We have to do this. We have to transform the take, make, waste, uh, linear supply chains, linear uh, manufacturing processes to a much more circular one. Uh, and, and we have to transform off of fossil fuels into, into renewable and much healthier fuels for the, for the world. So many things. And I think that's the big challenge is, is how fast do we change? What does it cost? Who runs it? Who leads it? Are there, what are the incentives? What are the disincentives? What are the barriers, both within markets and within individual companies? So, you know, we talk about you know, business has to change or business has to stop doing this or start doing that. It's not that easy. In fact, it can be just in, inexplicably difficult. Sophia, your generation has been more vocal about climate action. How are they factoring it into the decisions that they make in life? how they choose a career and evaluate a potential employer. I definitely think that climate change is starting to impact the way that my generation, my peers and friends go about their everyday lives in the sense that there is a study that was done that showed that one third of Gen Zers have personally altered their behavior in order to be more climate conscious. And so starting to assess how sustainable a business is. And we've definitely seen mass canceling of big fast fashion brands and companies that have been held accountable for greenwashing. I think that 
with the prevalence of social media for young people, it becomes much easier to discern which big brands and businesses are actually walking the walk when it comes to taking uh, adequate climate action. And because of a combination of peer pressure and um, a desire to take responsibility over our own like personal consumption, I do think that it is impacting the way that young people go about our everyday lives. And I think specifically on the point about uh, how it's impacting our career paths, I do think that more and more young people are inclined to think about sustainability when we are deciding what we want to do. But not even that everyone is studying environmental science or that everyone wants to be a scientist, but more so in the fact that my friends who are studying computer science are now looking at how they can model um, different like climate simulations of how it's going to impact like rising sea levels. And then my friends who are studying uh, theater are now looking at how they can create more sustainable theater sets. In previous years, talking to my peers, there was a large inclination to work for some specific big companies that they knew would pay really well. But now they're kind of balancing that alongside an interest in um, social impact and making sure that they're working for companies that actually are morally aligned with them. So I do think that I've definitely seen a shift among my friends in the sense that there are now like certain companies that are no longer trendy or appealing to work for just because of how negative their public reputation is. This has been a terrific discussion. I wanna thank all of you first for the incredible work that you continue to do. And then also just thank you for being here and joining us on Teal Talks. Thank you so much.